<laughs> Great. Please go on. Thank you. Um, I, I, again, uh, to echo the previous speakers, um, this is such an honor to be able to, to share this uh, story with, uh, with the work that's being done in India and led by Dr. Rajiv and, and all of the eminent professors who are joining this call. So thank you. So I'll be touching upon many of the similar topics, but trying to give it from a different angle. So I'll be talking about some of the different phenotypes of late pulmonary hypertension. I'll also um, be looking to present some contemporary diagnostic methods and some recent advances in echocardiographic assessment of chronic pulmonary hypertension with a focus on those premature infants. And then I want to help understand the clinical relevance and, and what I call early predictor markers of chronic pulmonary hypertension in preterm infants and then touch upon some screening approaches that can be apl applicable anywhere in the world. So another way to think about pulmonary hypertension, Kurt really um, did a great job presenting the paradigm of how I also think about pulmonary hypertension, trying to understand that pulmonary hypertension is just an increase in pulmonary artery pressure now defined as greater than 20 millimeters per mercury, but it's a combination of three entities, pulmonary vascular resistance, pulmonary blood flow, and then the left heart with the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And this is how I'm going to approach chronic pulmonary hypertension. And what we have learned from all of the speakers so far is that while the gold standard is cardiac catheterization, I'd argue that the first line screening and diagnostic approach is probably with echocardiography and our clinical acumen. So we've heard a little bit about the classification, but I always like to talk about how I approach it. There are term infants with pulmonary hypertension. They could be early or late. We've heard about the terminology with persistent fetal circulation, persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn, and what Patrick has termed or coined as acute pulmonary hypertension. I'll focus much of the talk on the preterm infants with early that Patrick nicely spoke about and late, and that Dr. Admin in his talk defined late as either chronic or sustained. And we'll go into some of the phenotype. So this is kind of the spectrum that I think about pulmonary vascular disease, which the most severe form is pulmonary hypertension. So you can have that early pulmonary vascular disease that Dr. Admin talked about. This comes from his excellent paper occurring usually in the first week of age. There's delayed adaptation. You can have early echo findings of later outcomes, and you can have that hypoxic respiratory failure that Kurt so eloquently described in his first talk. I'll focus more on chronic pulmonary vascular disease, prevents, presents weeks to months. You have high level of respiratory support, evolving RV dysfunction. I'll show you the hemodynamics behind that. I'll talk about some of the echocardiographic findings. And then finally, I'll touch a little bit about the sustained pulmonary vascular disease, what we see in children and adults and how this affects the blood pressure, the left ventricle, exercise intolerance, and why are we even having this symposium? Because what we're learning is that we are better at caring for these preterm infants. They are living longer, but they're not living without complications. And it's important to recognize how we can manage this early on. So in adulthood, we have learned that those infants with chronic pulmonary vascular disease have higher morbidity, higher mortality. They have poor growth, poor neurodevelopmental outcomes, and they have alterations in their right and left ventricular and pulmonary hemodynamics. Let me give you some examples. This is an old study out of Boston, now almost 14 years of age, where infants who had severe pulmonary hypertension, as we can see on this Kaplan-Meier curve, were more likely to have a higher mortality over time. Some more contemporary data from um, uh, Rolf Berger's group has also um, uh, um, also shown that those infants with higher blood pressure, suprasystemic pressures in those lungs are also more at risk to have mortality over time. But what we learned from this data, which is fascinating, that is if you get out of the first six months of age, you actually could potentially have a, a good outcome, even if you have pulmonary hypertension, but we know that the pulmonary vascular disease will persist. Some recent data looking at growth and neurodevelopment those infants with severe bronchopulmonary dysplasia or chronic lung disease have worth, worse growth parameters at 18 to 24 months. 
and worse cognitive scores on their Bailey neurodevelopmental testing at 18 to 24 months. Some data looking at the risk for pulmonary hypertension as a child and in early adulthood came from kind of large population studies from Estelle Nuremberg, basically showing that irrespective of all of the common risk factors of pulmonary hypertension, so congenital heart disease, congenital diaphragmatic herniation, just being born less than 36 weeks gestational age will increase your risk of developing pulmonary hypertension in early childhood and adulthood. And work from a good colleague of mine, Kara Goss, followed ex preterm infants to young adulthood. And what she showed that the preterm born adults had higher mean pulmonary artery pressure, higher pulmonary vascular resistance in figure B, higher afterload in figure C, an altered right ventricle and pulmonary arterial coupling um, in, in figure D. So what we tried to do initially was kind of put this story together. So if you're born preterm, we know that Patrick has highlighted the unique preterm myocardium. We know that there are special features that happen over the first year of age, but what connects that to the adult cardiovascular phenotype? So doing a meta-analysis that was published this past year, we looked at many, many measures of right and left ventricular performance and pulmonary hemodynamics in all studies comparing term infants to preterm infants. And what we found, this is just a forest plot of one of the measures where we looked at strain, which is a measure of RV function that I'll speak about in a few minutes. All of the measures when compared between term and preterm infants in this forest plot seem to favor the term infants. And what we were able to conclude from this large meta-analysis is that preterm infants over time from birth through adulthood have altered RV and LV systolic and diastolic function, have altered right ventricle pulmonary arterial coupling and evidence of persistent pulmonary vascular disease, and they have smaller and thicker right and left ventricles. So being able to take a step backwards, we can really see that as the cardiac phenotypes unfold, irrespective of the pulmonary hypertension, we know that there are unique features early, middle, and late that play into the adult cardiovascular phenotypes that put these preterm infants at risk for heart failure and later pulmonary hypertension. So taking a step back, I think it's important to understand the etiologies of chronic neonatal pulmonary hypertension. Both Kurt and Dr. Admin, and Dr. McNamara have shown us that it's a relationship of pulmonary vascular resistance, where we can see a maldeveloped pulmonary vasculature, where we have examples like trisomy 21. We have examples like the primary surfactant deficiencies. You could have a maladaptive pulmonary vasculature. That's the one that most of us are very familiar with, where you have elevated pulmonary vascular resistance from BPD or chronic lung disease, although you can have some genetic dis, uh, morphology as well. And finally, that left atrium or that pulmonary venous congestion can be from too much pulmonary blood flow, like we see in the PDA, or increased pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, which we may see in pulmonary vein stenosis, which I'll touch upon later. So when we combine the adaptive and development of the pulmonary vasculature with the three phenotypes that have been listed, pulmonary vascular resistance, pulmonary blood flow, and pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, we get a complete etiology of chronic neonatal pulmonary hypertension. Now the risk factors have been talked about for early or acute pulmonary hypertension, looking at maternal, fetal, and neonatal, but it's important to understand them for late pulmonary hypertension based on race, prolonged rupture of membranes, oligohydraminose, and in the neonatal phase, prematurity, left-sided obstructions, trisomy 21, CDH, and so forth. When I think about the hemodynamic profile, I like to take a step back because I know there's a lot of different um, um, education levels on this call where it's the cardiovascular system is talked about by the heart or the pump. We think about the vasculature or the transport network, and we think about the blood as a transport vehicle. And what Patrick has nicely defined in his work over time, it's a balance of oxygen consumption and oxygen delivery, where it's to determine cellular homeostasis. It is a balance between the cardiac output, the blood oxygen delivery and consumption, and the target organ, where cardiac output is really determined by preload, how much blood comes into the heart, 
afterload, how much blood has to face with resistance leaving the heart and contractility. All of this will help us lead into the talk by uh, Satyan and Rajiv in understanding the therapeutic interventions for pulmonary hypertension. But when we think about it in terms of pulmonary hypertension, we look at the right ventricle and its target organ, the pulmonary vasculature. And it, that's the balance that we have to play into. So Patrick alluded to this, but the preterm myocardium has abnormal contractile properties. The preterm myocardium, based on the Frank Starling curve, as preload goes up, it gets to the point where they can increase their contractility and has abnormal diastolic function. And finally, as afterload goes up, the contractility can only hit a certain maximal um, level. And again, preterm infants are just at a disadvantage with alteration in loading conditioning and, uh, and augmenting cardiac output. But this is really one of the take-home slides which we have not yet seen from the other talks. It's a balance of right ventricular performance or function and contractility on the y-axis and RV afterload on the x-axis. This is adapted from uh, Dr. Abman's group, but as we access the functional reserve with elevated pulmonary vascular resistance on the x-axis, you hit peak function at some point on the y-axis with an ultimate of RV failure. I like to think about this in stages. I call it coupling. When the right ventricle remains coupled to its RV afterload or its pulmonary vasculature, all is good. In stage one, under normal conditions, RV function is maintained. In stage two, as RV afterload goes up, RV function will match the afterload. You may see some hypertrophy to help with that matching. As you enter into stage three, with a further rise in afterload, you may see some RV dilatation, but ultimately the right ventricle function can no longer keep up with the rising afterload and will uncouple from its afterload, which leads to a decrease in work, efficiency, and ultimately failure. And this is the paradigm that you need to think about when you're thinking about the management of chronic pulmonary hypertension. So when we put this all together, between all of the talks you've heard so far, what goes into RV function? Preload, contractility, and afterload. Patrick mentioned about altered LV function, I like to add in another paradigm. There's altered RVPA coupling. And the treatment paradigm is all based around this. You can improve LV function. You can reduce RV afterload with pulmonary vasodilators. You can augment RV function. You could optimize RV preload, but you better stage the RVPA coupling because that will help you determine how you manage each one of these entities. Next, I want to talk about the hemodynamic assessment of cardiac mechanics. We all often think about of echocardiography, cardiac catheterization, cardiac CT, and cardiac MR. Now, most people around the world have their clinical exam, vital signs, some biomarkers, but I'm going to focus primarily on echocardiography. And when I think about echocardiography, I go back to this paradigm. I think about it in terms of the assessment of preload, afterload, contractility, and morphology. All of this has been nicely summarized by my good friend Afif El Kufash and Patrick McNamara. And I'll give just a brief overview of some of the evolving measures and the conventional measures to assess pulmonary hypertension. Keeping in mind that there is no ideal measure. You want a measure that works for every gestational age and birth weight. You want a measure that's continuous, non-invasive, safe, feasible, allows for early diagnosis, works in both congenital and acquired heart disease, well, there's no measure, as Patrick alluded to, that fits all of these builds, so you have to use them in your phenotyping. The diagnostic approach for neonatal pulmonary hypertension was nicely described by uh, our recent work in the Journal of Perinatology as well as Clinics of Perinatology, where echo was the first line screening and diagnosis. Cardiac cath in the right center and the right time can confirm diagnosis or assess severity. And in the right center and the right time, there's evolution of the use of cardiac MR and cardiac CT. So the diagnosis of neonatal pulmonary hypertension, what I call the conventional approach, looks at qualitative assessment of right ventricular morphology, as I told you through the stages, and the septal wall flattening. The quantitative estimates are the degree of shunting that Patrick alluded to, 
and then using the tricuspid regurgitation jet with the estimation of the right ventricular systolic pressures. So let's look at RV morphology. It's complex. It's a tripartite stru structure. There's an inlet component, there's an apical trabecular component, and there's an outlet component. It's very challenging to measure with 2D, but with some novel approaches by Patrick's group and our own group, you can use a four-chamber view. You can even use a three-chamber view. It's easy to obtain. It's feasible. We've shown that it's reliable in term and preterm infants. It can provide mechanistic changes, and it's been shown to correlate with long-term changes in adults and children. Some of the important limitations are it's hard to see the right ventricle. You need a skill set and a training to obtain the right ventricular free wall. And we're lacking some cutoff values that are necessarily related to diseases. But over time with two-dimensional and three-dimensional and volumetrics, this could be a very useful tool. I show this for each one of the measures, but there's been a lot of work looking at these measures, showing how they adapt in pulmonary hypertension. I won't go into the depth, but I just wanted this so others can look at the references on their own time. When I think about the assessment of cardiac mechanics, I think about it with three approaches. A nice video put together by Afif al Kufash shows that to assess cardiac function, you think about it in three domains. The first domain is looking at a change in cavity dimensions from the diastole, the largest, to systole, the smallest. So that's fractional area of change, or more commonly on the left side, ejection fraction. In the second example, we look at displacement and velocity of a single point from baseline during end diastole to a new position, a new movement in end systole. The examples are the tissue Doppler imaging, or TAPSI on the right side, or MAPSI on the left side. And finally, which is a more novel, specific and sensitive measure of function is looking at deformation imaging from a baseline shape in diastole to a new shape in systole. This is strain imaging, which I'll speak about in a few moments. So fracture of change allows us to look at the change from end diastole to end systole. We could do this in a focus four chamber view and using a novel technique by Patrick's group, we can look at the apical three-chamber view, giving us inflow and outflow. It's relatively easy to obtain. It's definitely feasible and reliable. And there's great correlation with MRI, right ventricular ejection fraction, and it's angle independent. Some limitations are that it does require some skill set with wall visualization. It's operator dependent, and it's less suitable for longitudinal comparisons as the geometry may change over time. Here are some examples of studies that have used fracture of change in chronic pulmonary hypertension and has been shown to be mechanistically relevant and prudent. When we think about tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion or TAPSI, again, it's a displacement of a single point. It's that point at the tricuspid annular with an excursion from end diastole to end systole. It's relatively easy to obtain. You can obtain this with the apical four chamber view, or you can use M mode physiology. There are normal values. It's been shown to be reliable in chronic pulmonary hypertension. However, we've also learned that some of the important limitations are that there are a tethering effect to the left ventricle. This is one of my take home messages. Whenever you have right ventricular dysfunction, please don't forget to look at the left ventricle. And cutoff for diseases do vary. However, there has been a wide range of studies date, dating back to Kostenberger's first study in 2011 to recent work by our group in 2019 using TAPSI to assess function in preterm infants with pulmonary hypertension. Now, tissue Doppler imaging also looks at a displacement of a single point. There are different values for children and for preterm infants, highlighted in figures two and figures three, it's relatively easy to obtain. It looks at both systolic and diastolic function. There are normal values. Now, again, there is some tethering to the left ventricle. It doesn't necessarily give you a global sense of what's going on. It's more of a regional measure of function and it's load dependent. And the final measure that I'll talk about after I just show you that there are great studies out there that have looked at tissue Doppler imaging in pulmonary hypertension 
and found significant differences. The last measure of strain. This is a novel measure to assess the change in shape of the myocardial wall. It's using novel technology that has been shown to be feasible and reproducible. It gives us a sense of loading conditions. Remember I talked about afterload and preload and strain rate, which is just the time derivative, gives us a sense of contractility. So really gives us a full sense of the cardiac output as it relates to different disease entities. It looks at regional and global function. And then the important limitations are there's an evolution with proprietary software, uh, it has to be done uh, by uh, experts. Uh, we're learning how to do offline analysis. So the studies are growing out there with the use of strain imaging. And a lot of work has been done by our group, groups in Ireland and Toronto, basically showing that there's a linear correlation with gestational age. And those infants with pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary vascular disease have worse measures of strain, both on the right and the left ventricular side. Now, it's important to understand RV afterload. Everybody on this call thinks of RV afterload in terms of pulmonary vascular resistance. It's actually a combination of pulmonary arterial compliance and pulmonary vascular resistance. In the lungs, they go in opposite directions. So as pulmonary artery compliance goes up, pulmonary vascular resistance goes down on the x-axis. In pulmonary hypertension or pulmonary vascular disease, there's an early phase. You have a mild increase in pulmonary vascular resistance on the x-axis highlighted in green, but you have a large decrease in pulmonary arterial compliance. Now you may have normal RV performance and you have, may have a clinically silent baby. In a later phase where established pulmonary hypertension, you'll have a significant increase in pulmonary vascular resistance. Look at the yellow on the x-axis, but only a very, very small drop in pulmonary artery compliance. You may have abnormal function and you may have a symptomatic baby. This is indicative of the TR jet and septal wall flattening that we've heard of. So these measures are actually only measures of late pulmonary vascular disease and established pulmonary hypertension. Now, here are the two examples that I'm showing, the TR jet and septal wall flattening. Now, briefly, the stories of the TR jet is phenomenal. I mean, it goes back to 1983 and work from Boston Children's where they looked at the TR jet and they compared it, sorry, they looked at septal wall configuration and they compared it to the flattening uh, of, of the, the septum. And in, again, only 29 children, they compared this septal wall flattening and found that uh, in children who had a flat septum, again, using invasive uh, cardiac cath, um, the 17 on the bottom had greater than 50% right ventricular pressure compared to the less than 50% on the top figure. So this uh, dogma persisted for many, many years. It still persists to this day. It does provide a quantitative assessment to a degree of right ventricular pressure. It, it gives us a sense of greater or less than 50%. That's really all. And it gives us a sense of the right ventricle to left ventricle pressures. But as Patrick has mentioned, it doesn't really capture early changes in RV afterload. And it's really less reliable in children with, with higher pressures. So the story of the TR jet is not so dissimilar. This comes from work um, in, in the 1980s comparing simultaneous echo on the x-axis and cath on the y-axis, showing somewhat of a nice correlation between echo and cath, giving us a sense that you could use the TR jet with some manipulation through the Bernoulli equation to give us an assessment of right ventricular afterload. Recent data from our group and group from uh, data from Steve Admin's group show that actually there are some limitations. And as you go up to higher pressures, the TR jet is not as reliable, which is shown by the red dots uh, from the GROW article uh, back in 2013. So truthfully with the TR jet, um, uh, what we've learned is that it gives a quantitative estimate of right ventricular pressures, but it's less reliable in children. Patrick showed that it's less reliable with impaired RV systolic function, and it doesn't fully capture all the changes in pulmonary arterial compliance and pulmonary vascular resistance. So this is work from Steve's group. Now, Patrick showed that in the early pulmonary hypertension, some of these qualitative and quantitative estimates are just not reliable. I think in the right hands, the TR jet and septal wall flattening could potentially be reliable. But again, these are in the hands of people who've been doing this for a long time with, with, with more than just eyeballing it. This is shown from a nice work from 2017. 
where the kappa scores were, were, were pretty decent for both research and clinical echoes. But it still doesn't solve the problem that these are measures of late pulmonary vascular disease. They don't give us a true sense of the early changes in pulmonary arterial compliance. So our group started to look at measures along the right ventricular outflow track. Rather than using a measure between the right ventricle and right atrium to give you a sense of the pulmonary vasculature, why not use a direct measure between the right ventricle and the pulmonary system? And that's where um, measures like pulmonary artery acceleration time or RV systolic time intervals come into place where you could have in figure A, a normal Doppler flow envelope leaving the right ventricle that's symmetric. Or in figure B, you have an example of increased afterload, decreased compliance, and you have a quick upslope of that Doppler envelope, which gives you a smaller pulmonary artery acceleration time. And what we have actually shown um, in data from 2016 between simultaneous cath and simultaneous echo, on the Y and X axis, respectively, that um, the lower, uh, uh, as you get higher measures of pulmonary artery acceleration time, you have a decrease in pulmonary vascular resistance. And likewise in figure B, as pulmonary artery compliance goes up, the pulmonary artery acceleration time goes down. So just finishing off this part, you can clearly see that the RV systolic time intervals are feasible, they're reliable, there are normal measures, this has been shown to be very good in children and infants. While their uh, proper indexing is, is, is evolving and you have to have good visual assessment of the morphology, I think this is going to become a, another way to assess pulmonary hypertension. This figure shows all the studies that are evolving um, in the world of neonatology that have used this measure to assess pulmonary vascular disease in children. So another measure, uh, and this is the last of the measures I'll speak about, is the eccentricity index, which is just a quantitative way to look at the septal wall flattening. Steve Admin has spoken about this in many of his talks, but we can clearly see that with a flat septum, the eccentricity index will be greater than one. And there are many evolving studies using eccentricity index. And there's even data showing that there are cutoff points greater than 1.3 to highlight those children who have elevated pressures, and pulmonary hypertension. And again, there's a tremendous benefit in using this quantitative measure to augment and complement the septal wall flattening by qualitative visualization. So we've summarized all of this in a recent publication in the Journal of Pediatrics, looking at measures of systolic function, capsis, strain, fracture of change, measures of diastolic function, measures of RV afterload, combining both the TR jet with the quality tentative measures of eccentricity index and RV systolic time intervals. We've looked at RV morphology. We have looked at the left heart. And of course, we've looked at shunts and finally the systemic perfusion. We have summarized what we believe uh, and experts believe are what are the class one recommended measures, the TR jet, systolic time intervals, septal configuration, eccentricity index. And we've provided other measures that could be suggested and then some research measures that in the hopeful next couple of years will evolve into the suggested and recommended. We've even published some normal cutoff values for early hemodynamic predictors, looking at all of these measures from eccentricity index to fracture of change to strain measures. And this hopefully will provide a guide for the field throughout the world to help us better characterize the different phenotypes of pulmonary hypertension. So, Dr. Admin spoke about this, early predictors of chronic pulmonary vascular disease and pulmonary hypertension. We know that these kids are at risk, but we want to be able to identify this earlier. So in nice studies that he presented, I won't go into depth, as early as one week of age, you can use septal wall flattening potentially to identify those children with later chronic pulmonary hypertension. We also use strain imaging. We found on the x-axis that those asymptomatic infants had a left ventricular pattern, but the pulmonary hypertension children at 36 weeks and beyond had a right ventricular pattern that, that was evident at one week of age, almost as if the PVR had not dropped and it was indicative of later chronic pulmonary hypertension. We also used the RV systolic time intervals. As early as 32 weeks, we were able to identify those children who would go on to develop later chronic pulmonary hypertension at 36 weeks. So these are early measures 
of chronic pulmonary vascular disease and chronic pulmonary hypertension. Amish Jane in Toronto is now trying to validate all of these measures with a longitudinal prospective study of close to 400 babies from centers all over the world, including Ireland, the US and Canada um, and England. Um, so more data will come out over the next couple of years. And finally, it's important to understand the limitations of echocardiography. As Patrick and Steve spoke about, it doesn't always gives us the sense of disease severity, the cardiovascular disease, the pulmonary vascular disease, and the lung airway disease. And in order to understand that, you have to go beyond echo, and in the right center, in the right place, cardiac catheterization becomes another tool. We think about it when echo cannot identify the severity. We think about it when there's other comorbidities. We think about it in evaluation of shunts and interventions, and with poor responsiveness to all the medications that Rajiv and Satyan will speak about in the next settings. I'd be remiss not to talk about pulmonary vein stenosis as it's becoming a highly impactful entity within the world of neonatology. And you can clearly see that it fits clearly into the increased pulmonary capillary wedge pressure with the etiologies of chronic pulmonary hypertension. Just briefly, there was a case series of 26 preterm infants done by uh, Ben Frank out in Colorado with Steve Admin where pulmonary vascular diagno was diagnosed in seven infants and only suspected by echo in three of these seven cases, highlighting the fact that echo may not be the perfect entity always to diagnose pulmonary vein stenosis. In another case series of 39 preterm infants, only 56% were diagnosed by echocardiography. So it's important, in my opinion, as we learn more about pulmonary vein stenosis, and this large meta-analysis showed that while in all infants, it occurs in preterm infants at about a third of the time, about 50% of the time, there's evidence of pulmonary hypertension. And what we've learned is that the classification of pulmonary vein stenosis, that while there are many, there are specific populations, specifically the X premature infant and comorbidities specifically include chronic lung disease associated with prematurity. So if you have persistent respiratory requirements, the child is sicker than what you would think they should be. You should entertain around 36 weeks, the entity of pulmonary vein stenosis with the evolution of different treatment modalities, both non-invasive and invasive. This is an entity that now children are surviving long-term. So cardiac catheterization can be an important tool to help us understand the severity. There are limitations when linking chemodynamics to mechanisms, and it has to be done in a specialized center. I won't spend time on cardiac CT, but the take-home for cardiac CT, as well as the take-home for cardiac MRI, it's an evolving tool that in the right center can provide additional information to delineate between lung disease, heart disease, and vascular disease. I wanna just spend the last minute or so talking about screening. What we have learned from multiple studies over time is that just because you are a preterm infant, if you have severe BPD, you are likely to have pulmonary hypertension up to 40% of the time. But we've learned that even without um, BPD, even without severe lung disease, you have a two to 6% risk of developing kind of pulmonary hypertension in the no to mild BPD groups. So work from our own group showed that preterm infants at one year of age, irrespective of the degree of their lung, their cardiac or their vascular uh, insult, still had evidence of pulmonary vascular disease when compared to the term infants. This is concerning that all preterm infants still have alterations in pulmonary vascular disease. There are a lot of different screening algorithms out there by the AHA, European Pediatric PVD Network, the PPHNet, and the BPD Collaborative. Different degrees based on severity and timing and the methods and the rescreening. So our Boston cohort decided that we were gonna look at all babies less than 32 weeks. And we basically said, if you're on respiratory support and there's many ways to define that at 36 weeks, you need a screening echo. You need somebody to think about the entity of pulmonary hypertension. Now, if you have no pulmonary hypertension, that's fine. If you have pulmonary hypertension, we get experts involved. And if you don't have pulmonary hypertension, but are still on respiratory support a month later, we're going to repeat the echo. If you have two negative echoes, the chances of pulmonary hypertension are slim to none. 
We have a lot of other indications. If you're less than 28 weeks, if you're IUGR, maybe you'll get an echo earlier. The take home message for everybody on this call is you got to think about your patient population, the timing of the screening. What's your screening modality? Is it clinical, biomarkers, echocardiography? We chose echo. And then the timing for follow-up and negative screen, and then additional risk factors. And using this paradigm, you can then develop your own screening approaches for the late or chronic pulmonary hypertension in the extreme preterm infant. So to summarize, preterm late pulmonary hypertension, as Patrick mentioned, is a physiological spectrum of phenotypes characterized by elevated pulmonary pressure, and impaired RV performance. There's high morbidity and high mortality beyond the neonatal period. Please be aware of all the available tools to help assess the phenotypes. And the goal is to provide comprehensive information regarding the determinants of cardiac performance. That's preload, afterload, contractility, and morphology, and then disease severity with relative contributions from what Steve kind of termed kind of the three-headed monster the pulmonary vasculature, cardiac, and lung disease. And with that, I'd just like to, to end with this last slide. This is a slide that could help us with research in the, in the future. We need to validate two-dimensional echo. We need to have uniform screening approaches throughout the world. We need to look at predictive modeling, consider hemodynamic multi-imaging modalities. But I think the most important thing that you could do at your own center is establish a chronic cardiopulmonary team of neonatologists, cardiologists, pulmonologists, respiratory therapists, researchers, data scientists to enhance interdisciplinary communication. And with that, I'd like to thank Dr. Rajiv and the entire um, uh, committee for this wonderful opportunity to spend the morning with all of you. And uh, thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Philip, for the brilliant presentation. Um, there are a few questions. I will take a couple as our time is limited. Uh, what drugs do you use to treat chronic pulmonary hypertension, oral medications? Yes, wonderful question. So um, we're going to hear great talks from Satyan and Dr. Rajiv um, on, on um, the use of sildenafil and some other oral medications. What I would uh, employ uh, uh, the audience to remember is you are looking for medications that can potentially augment preload, augment contractility, or reduce RV afterload. And that's kind of the focus that I think about. It's important to understand what is the insult on the right ventricle and the pulmonary vasculature, and then you could individually tailor your medication based on that. Commonly, to answer the question bluntly, if we have a child with chronic pulmonary hypertension and we've made that assessment. Um, we often, uh, beyond doing any shunt manipulations or optimization of ventilatory strategies, optimization of nutrition, optimization of what I call the phenotypes of BPD, which is alveolar disease, pulmonary vascular disease, large airway malaysia, or even obstructive. Once you've addressed all of these non-pharmacological approaches and you think the baby truly has pulmonary vascular disease, we initially start with sildenafil as our primary medication. And Dr. Rajiv will, will talk about that in much depth. But what I want people to understand, it's not just, I have pulmonary hypertension, treat with a medication. You want to make sure there's no sepsis physiology. You want to make sure there's no pulmonary vein stenosis. You want to treat the alveolar disease with either, sometimes it's diuretic, sometimes there's steroids, enhancement of nutrition. If there's tracheal bronchial malaysia, is this a baby who needs higher positive end expiratory pressure? It's not just about treating with a drug. It's doing the whole cocktail to understand the phenotypes. Again, the phenotypes are alveolar, pulmonary vascular disease, large airway, or malacia, as well as sometimes the puffy baby or genetic etiologies. Uh, for you. One question to you. What is your protocol for sildenafil in, in your center? So our, our protocol uh, is based on, on the underlying etiology. So if, again, I've gone through that whole paradigm, we um, will, will start sildenafil on these children. Um, sometimes, now, obviously, we're in America, and, and it's not the same paradigm, Dr. Jeev, you have to deal with in India, but, but oftentimes the babies are acutely ill. We actually may start nitric before we start sildenafil, but if we're confident starting sildenafil, we'll start this sildenafil, you know, the one milligram uh, Q8, 
we, we try and do PO, that's the ideal. And then because we have the luxury of getting serial echocardiograms, we'll be able to follow the serial echocardiograms and look at the pressures. We'll also be able to see if we're able to lower the FiO2 requirement and coupling that with the ventilatory strategies, we're able to then see, can we come down on the ventilatory strategies? We try and do the least invasive before progressing to the most invasive. There's different theories. We also are in a center where we can do cardiac catheterization like they can do in Colorado and Iowa very easily. Our general approach is before we would jump to a confirmation with cardiac catheterization, we would be using kind of a secondary agent. Or if we would start sildenafil and not have a response to it, we might use cardiac catheterization. But I implore you that you need to be in a center that can handle that. So that's the approach to sildenafil. Thank you very much.